Hello and welcome back to another presentation. Today we are covering a variety of maintenance operations that can be carried out on sports turf surfaces. So this can be anything from the football pitches all the way to the golf greens and pretty much anything in between, including amenity lawns. So what is the importance of sports turf maintenance? Obviously the main things are we um, we create a surface which is able to be played on. So we enhance the playability and safety. Uh, it improves the aesthetic appeal of the pitches uh, and it prolongs the lifespan of the turf. That's the whole point in the maintenance regime. In this presentation, we want to cover the two main topics here for the level two sports turf. Uh, we've got K16, which is to understand the maintenance operations for sports turf quality and K17, so learning the day to day maintenance techniques for sports turf surfaces. Now, there is quite a lot of crossover into other presentations that we've done in the past. So what I'll do is I'll just leave a link on the timestamps for each one of those. So if you want to go into a little bit more detail on any particular topic, there is a lot more detail. Uh, an example of that is the data collection. It's also part of the maintenance, but we've covered that in a much longer episode that you can find on YouTube. So types of operations, there's quite a few, but I've broken it down to sort of the main ones here. Scarification, top dressing, irrigation management, pest disease control, mowing practices, fertilization, marking out and painting, soil testing, aeration, debris removal, including leaves, and frost or snow protection. So we'll start with scarification. So scarification is also known as dethatching or verticutting. It is the process of mechanically removing thatch or moss from the surface of the turf. It doesn't have to be with a machine. This can also be done with rakes, with brushes, um, you know, any sort of machinery which does that process. So the purpose is we're trying to eliminate the thatch and promote better water and nutrient penetration into the soil. In terms of moss control, uh, we can disturb the moss and its growth habits, uh, then promoting a healthier sports turf as well. There's a wide variety of equipment we can use from scarifiers to verticutters. These are machines that are designed particularly uh, to cut into the turf and remove the thatch and moss from that layer above the soil profile. There's a quite a few different things here. We're starting with best practices, timing. Obviously, we tend to do this during the, the growing seasons, uh, but it's not always the case. There might be times when you do have to scarify, you know, closer to the winter months, but odds are uh, if you've managed to get to winter and you need to scarify, there's probably a much deeper line issue than just needing to scarify. How often we do it depends on the level of thatch and the buildup, but generally, you know, most sports pitches once or twice a year. This is not just for removal of moss or weeds. This can just be thinning out the grass during the growing period, for example. Depth of cut, we want to adjust this based on the type of grass, the conditions, and then obviously sort of soil profile. Uh, anything that might impact how the scarifier or the verticutter works. We don't want to be taking too much out in one go. We also uh, want to ensure that we're taking out enough rather than having to go back over it again. So the benefits are the improved turf health. We enhance that circulation, as I mentioned, around the crown of the plant. Uh, we encourage new growth and we can reduce disease risks with that new uh, air moving around the plant. Enhanced water infiltration, we, it helps prevent water logging, improves water absorption because that layer between the soil and the air is being taken away so the water can penetrate through quite easier. Considerations, the impact on the turf appearance. So it will temporarily disrupt the appearance and it will look bad for a couple of weeks. We'll get those lines, uh, particularly in, you know, dense swords where you've been scarifying. If you've done multiple passes, you'll get your uh, diamonds and so on and so forth. But we can look at things such as the, the post irrigation care and we can we can try and grow the grass out as quickly as possible to sort of cover any damage like this. You know, we can scarify and then we can go over with a brush to try and comb some of the, the grass back after we've removed some of the thatch and some of the dead grass uh, to try and create 
that even surface again almost immediately. Um, but things like adequate irrigation, fertilization, uh, and you know, this will help massively on our post scarification renovations. Top dressing uh, involves applying a thin layer of material onto the surface of the sports turf. You know, we're, we're trying to level off the surface usually, or we want to improve the soil structure. This can also help with the thatch management, but you can see it can also be done wrong. You can see on the bottom right uh, where they've clearly top dressed for a number of years, then they've got a layer of thatch and then they've top dressed on top of that. And then we just end up with them organic um, anaerobic layers within the soil where water won't penetrate. Disease spores um, will germinate within there as well and grow. Uh, and generally we will have a much weaker grass as well um, because you know the root rot and everything else within that area. Um, things we can use, we've got sand, we've got soil mixtures, we've got compost we can use. We use a mixture of all three. Most sports pitches use a 70-30 sort of mix. It depends on the sort of spec of the, the golf course it is uh, and depends on what material you might be using in that particular area. So the application techniques, obviously for an even distribution, we want to be using something such as a top dresser, uh, you know, a little Scots push spreader um, rather than doing it by hand because we're not going to be able to get that uniformity. We might be able to go over it afterwards with a brush and try and scrub it in to get it uniform, but it's probably going to be much quicker if we use a, a, a machine which is particularly designed for doing exactly that in the first place. Uh, it's best applied during the growing season, more helpful when it's dry. It's a little bit easier to spread, a little bit easier to um, brush into a surface and get it to where you want. Uh, when it's wet, it's not the end of the world, but you know you can use things like the irrigation to help you uh, get that sand off the leaf and down into the profile where you'd want it. And aeration can be accommodated in with this as well. It totally depends on the growing conditions and the maintenance goals of your sports fields or your uh, sports turf, should I say, uh, on how often or when you do uh, top dress those areas. So for the benefits, we can look at a few things. Now, enhanced routine is quite a long goal sort of thing. Um, but overall, you know, we can help change uh, the soil profile. We can reduce water logging. Um, that, uh, the sand in the profile, for example, would enhance the water movement. And we can reduce thatch because we're helping to break down those layers, uh, putting in different types of soil while aerating, scarifying at the same time, uh, really trying to improve the, the facilities and the place where the, the turf grass is living. The considerations we need to think about is choosing the right sort of top dressing materials which are compatible with the existing soil that is on site. You know, you don't want to be spreading compost on your sports turf surface within a stadium because you're going to make the top of the surface really slick, really slippery. Um, you know, players are going to be falling over. It's not desirable. We want a more sandy profile, uh, you know, maybe with reinforcements and so on and so forth. Um, post care, the sort of stuff we can be using, you know, I've mentioned irrigation. Uh, mowing, we might have to uh, adjust the heights of the mower to accommodate the, the added material. We also don't want to be sending a load of sand for us real mowers, for example. Dulling those blades, um, making the uh, um, mechanics' lives hell, basically. Um, but in terms of equipment using that we're going to be using for top dressing, we can use anything from toe behind top dressers to the, the push spreaders as well, or the little sizes spread that you see there on the top right. There's lots of different types. There's ones which just drop, or you've got the bottom right there, D Dakota with the discs on it, uh, and that throws the uh, top dressing material. It just depends on your application and how you need it. Some people prefer one type, some people prefer the other. Irrigation management, so we're thinking about sort of consistent moisture levels within the turf, maintaining optimal soil moisture for turf growth, temperature regulation, so assisting temperature control and stress reduction within the turf. Um, so watering schedules, people say we should adhere to early morning, late evening. It's not always the case. You know, sports games go on during the middle of the day. We might need to irrigate at different times. Uh, we might also have different events on at different times. So we just have to work around those sort of things. But obviously, ideally, early morning, late evening. Frequency completely depends on the climate, turf type, area, conditions, what it needs. Um, this is why data collection and moisture um, Moisture data is so important to understanding, you know, what, what's happening within the field. Seasonal variations. Now, with most irrigation systems, 
you know, hunter, the rain birds, you can change uh, and allow for the seasonal variations. Obviously, during the summer, you might need to water more. During the winter, you might need to water less. Uh, so you can make these percentage changes on your system. If you're hand watering, obviously, that's just something that you would or wouldn't then do at that particular time or year. Uh, we need to think about water conservation, uh, you know, smart irrigation systems, like I say, can we use less water over winter? We don't need to put down the same amount. We use things such as soil moisture sensors to help us uh, know exactly what's going on, how much moisture is in the profile and our watering techniques as well. You know, can we um, use cycles, you know, cycle and soak um, to prevent runoff? So as opposed to putting the irrigation on for 15 minutes, can we do it two minutes and then do it again in 15 minutes for another two minutes uh, and have the same amount of moisture within the profile and use uh, a, a you know, percentage less of water in the same in the same time. So the equipment, obviously we've got things such as sprinklers, there's drip irrigations, there's hand, hand watering that we can carry out. Um, there's a few different options, but it depends on the, the site, the situation. So a type of turf, um, you know, and the layout as well, you might not be able to get irrigation in certain places. Regular maintenance is important uh, about the turf and irrigation equipment. And I've spoke about this in a bit, a little bit more detail on another presentation. So we won't go too wild, um, but we'll just cover these next few topics. See so on the right, we've got the two sprinklers. You've got different heads, different nozzles. They'll change the throw, uh, you know, the pressure, the water rates. Um, all things we will need to be considered. Um, so benefits, obviously, we're trying to promote that growth, uh, avoiding overwatering to reduce the risk of diseases uh, and minimizing water uses to promote sustainability. Considerations, we need to think about local water regulations and restrictions, the type of turf we've got and any sort of weather conditions. You know, if we know it's going to rain tomorrow, we might need to dial back the irrigation a little bit and use some of that natural rainfall that we've got coming from the sky as opposed to using water that we might have collected or mains water for example monitoring and adjusting you know visual inspections there's lots of monitoring tools online so various apps where we can see exactly how much water we've put down and the water content within the soil and we can make those adjustments dependent on that data Seasonal changes, I've mentioned a bit about that, but obviously in sort of warm season grasses, for example, um, there's going to be a lot more dormancy within the turf. So we might actually have long periods of time where we don't really irrigate or do anything. Um, but then on, on summer stress, for example, we might want to be watering a little bit often uh, during those hotter periods to reduce the uh, stress on the turf. Pest and disease control. So we're looking at things like visual inspections. We've done a lot of this recently on our data collection presentation. Uh, you know, identification of common symptoms like discoloration, wilting, and unusual growth patterns usually tells us we have some sort of disease, damage, uh, disorder, or pests involved in the process. So we can use things such as the IPM programs, which we've also covered before. So we've got the biological controls, the cultural controls, and then last resort are chemical controls if needed. So it's typically pesticides, but like I say, they should be a last resort. If we are using pesticides, we have to think about safe and effective use of them, you know, identifying the exact type of weed, da damage, disease, pest that we have to then ensure that we're putting down the correct applications following those instructions that are on the manual. So we need to adhere to them strictly to ensure that it is nice and safe, the practices that we're carrying out. Uh, and then the sort of application equipment that we're using needs to be ensured that it's calibrating and working correctly, not leaking those sort of things. So there's lots of common turf pests, obviously knowing the main ones, we can help identify any sort of issues easily. If not, we can use things such as Google search engines uh, to figure out exactly what we've got going on within our sports turf. Um, common turf diseases, obviously we've got sort of fungal diseases, bacterial diseases, uh, and there's not really many others outside of that, but we get the odd one here and there with sort of deficiencies. Um, so you can see in the bottom right, uh, appears to be a little patch of red thread. We know that it's if we get some nitrogen on that at the right time and watered in, we might be able to grow that one out pretty easily. And it's just thought process like that, for example. 
Um, preventative measures, going back to that red thread, if we know that every year we get red thread at a certain time, we can then obviously consider putting down applications of fertilizer in advance to, to sort of try and um, catch it before it happens, but it's not going to cause too much of a damage to our turf. It's just obviously not quite visually appealing. We want to encourage the turf growth uh, through proper mowing, fertilization and aeration. You can do things such as quarantining procedures where an area that you've mown uh, which has a disease, you can then go back to the, the shared washing machine off to, before you then go and cut the next area to ensure that you're not spreading diseases across area to area. You can use things such as turf uh, varieties that are resistant to certain particular diseases or, you know, they might be better suited in better areas where it might be slightly warmer in a stadium on one end um, to try and reduce that disease um, outbreak. Uh, monitoring and early intervention, so continuously monitoring turf conditions, uh, any early signs of pests and diseases. Um, we can address issues as soon as they're identified to prevent prevent any further spreading. So record keeping, so keeping records of any pests and diseases, any treatments, any outcomes that we see from any treatments that we do put down so we can sort of see if what we have done has worked or hasn't. Uh, and this is where the data analysis comes into it so we can make more informed decisions based on trends uh, for our management decisions. Mowing practices, so we want to try uh, and mow the pitches as often as we can, but obviously not three or four times a day because that would just be unsustainable. Um, we want to try and promote that dense, thick, healthy turf um, while also keeping it visually appealing and playable. So we want to ensure that we have a nice clean cut as well so we're not causing any potential damage or disease um, opportunities for the turf to be attacked upon you know we just put a cut, brand new cut clean edge in it we want to make sure that, that cut is nice as clean as possible um, to ensure that we aren't allowing places for disease spores to get into the turf plant um, now depending on the height depends on the grass type depends on the condition depends on the sports field Typically, cool seasons tend to be slightly longer, but it's there's not really a lot in it, to be honest. Um, and warm seasons tend to be a little bit shorter, uh, especially on the, the the longer grasses. You know, you can get rye up to 80, 70 mil uh, and still be topping the top of it and still have a for a rugby field, for example, if you really went that far, council rugby field. Um, whereas warm season grasses tend to grow quite laterally, so you don't really end up with a lot of that uh, high, apart from in the seed heads or any sort of seed heads on the, the sports turf surface, even for cool grasses. Um, so regular maintenance of the mowing equipment, blade sharpening, equipment checks, height adjustments, so pre-start checks, all of the usual stuff that we've covered before. Mowing frequency then depend on the seasonal uh, variations and the weather conditions. You know, if the pitch is flooded, we're not going to be able to mow it. If it's the middle of summer and it's not raining in six weeks and we don't have irrigation, the odds are the pitch hasn't also grown, so we might not have to cut it as well. Uh, we can alternate the patterns uh, to try and uh, alleviate compaction, particularly around the edge of the fields, but also try and tiller the grass uh, to cover get a good coverage across the surface uh, especially for games like football where the ball needs to roll across the surface if we don't have any gaps or anything like that we won't we aren't going to affect the actual play of the sport um it doesn't really matter uh sort of how you do this as long as you've sort of got a minimum of two directions most sports turf managers would also then typically brush against or they might vertically cut against at some point just to ensure that they're standing the grass back up and nothing's growing too long across the lines where we constantly mow clip management we can do three different things we can mulch we can bag and box or we can dispose of them completely um each one depends on the surface and the, and the outcome. If we've recently put a fertilizer application down, you know, on a foliar or a disease prevention, um, we might want to cut that off the surface um, and take it away. We might want to cut it and drop it and have it uh, still be uptaken by the, the roots after it's been broken down within the soil. Uh, whereas if we're wanting to remove the clippings in the middle of summer, you know, we've got grass growing like wild uh, and we've got a game on, you know, we don't want them clippings on the surface. We want to remove them for, to reduce any sort of thatch buildup or, you know, players slipping, for example. Uh, we will use those boxes on the mower. 
or even go behind and with another machine to collect those clippings. Now, the time of mowing can massively affect you know, the stress on the grass. Obviously, like we say, if it's the middle of the day in the summer, you're going to affect the grass a lot more than if you're mowing during the evening or cooler parts of the day. Um, you know, this makes more difference in the summer, as I mentioned, because then obviously we've, we've got more chance of uh, the grass wilting and stress in the grass. Uh, rain, post rain mowing. So uh, we want to allow the turf to dry before mowing to prevent any sort of damage or any sort of soil lifting to the surface and also helps um, alleviate any sort of compaction issues that, would, that could happen with that as well. So we want to uh, adjust the mower based on the turf conditions. So this is height, this is quality of the cut, you know, this is, you know, the, the frequency that we're, we're carrying the work out as well. We can monitor compaction and things like those. Uh, the equipment that we can use, uh, we want to ensure that we've got the right equipment for the right area. We, do we need a cylinder mower on that ornamental lawn? Um, you know, should we use a rotary on the on the pitch this week uh, to collect debris as well as cutting it at the same time? So you're in the middle of the growing season, you don't have to worry too much about diseases. The weather's on your side. We can think about these considerations to ensure that we're, we're carrying out the correct practices, um, you know, and trying to promote the grass as much as possible, but in a sustainable way. Uh, and post mowing care, we can do things such as watering, especially during dry spells. Obviously, not something we want to do during the winter because we don't want to promote diseases and distress or issues. Um, and the big thing, yeah, we want to monitor for that stress, uh, constantly checking it and then adjusting our practices based on the turf and what it's telling us. Fertilization, quite an important one. Obviously, we've got NPK here, uh, nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. So nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, sorry. Uh, nitrogen typically promotes that lush green growth. Uh, phosphorus is normally the root development, and potassium aids the overall plant health and stress resilience. Now, they're not just particularly set on those things. That's not what they all do. They all do a bit of all sorts. Um, but that's the basic breakdown of the MPK. There is obviously also the micronutrients which come into play, uh, but these are the main three for us today. Um, types of fertilizer and applications. So you've got granular, liquid, and slow release fertilizers. Granular obviously goes onto the surface. Um, they can also be the slow releases. So they can release over a period of months, uh, or you can have a granular which only lasts a couple of days, depending on what you need, basically. Liquid fertilizers, a uh, little bit shorter window on how long they last, but you can sort of, you know, you can put a really big bump into the grass or you can uh, directly into the leaf or you can put a, a liquid down, which you intend to go into the soil and be uptaken by the uh, a plant for, via the roots. But it depends on what exactly you're after and how uh, the weather conditions are, if it's going to rain a lot, that might not be something that you want to do because you don't want it to le leach out of the surface. Your seasonal fertilization schedules, roughly in the spring, you're promoting, you know, that vigorous growth. Um, you want to focus on that. The summer, you want to sort of balance between growth and, and stress resistance. Autumn, this is more your root development and nutrient storage ready for the winter, trying to protect the plant as much as possible. Uh, winter, it's pretty much minimal to no fertilization. There might be some dormancy as well, uh, but the grass is going to slow down dramatically. And if you've got that storage right, you don't have to worry too much about it you might consider uh, a slow release fertilizer or, or, or different sort of type of fertilizer a liquid feed uh, over the winter months just to keep you topped up depending on your requirements so soil testing is a really important part of fertilization in, in ensuring that we understand how the nutrients that are already in the soil ph levels soil structure um, this helps us determine you know the frequency that we can put fertilizer down uh, and we'd adjust them based on those results to tailor the nutrient application based on the test results organic versus synthetic fertilizers you know, organics are derived from natural resources, uh, you know, release nutrients slowly. Synthetics are manufactured, which provides an immediate nutrient availability for the plant. Now, the application techniques for, in, 
for even distribution, we want to ensure the uniform coverage across the turf. So we're going to be using an actual spreading machine, ensuring that it's set up properly, ensuring that it's calibrated. Um, trying to avoid over application. So following those recommended application rates to prevent nutrient imbalances. Um, this can be something as simple as putting the wrong setting on, but also overlapping too much and causing banding, which we'll see on the next picture. Uh, and then, yeah, that calibration of the equipment to ensure that it's uh, being used correctly. So on the top right, you can see the banding where uh, the darker green bits have had double application of fertilizer. Um, you won't notice it immediately straight away, but after a couple of weeks, once the fertilizer starts to work off, uh, in this case, you know, with the organic um, regular fertilizer, uh, you can see that the banding has started appear appearing. So this is obviously one of the, the challenges um, with fertilising sports turf, but the other things are such as runoff, you know, it, that application we've had a lot of rainfall, um, the nutrients are just going to get wasted and taken and leached out of the surface. And the environmental impact, you know, we want to choose fertilisers which minimise the environmental impact so they're not shipped right across the world, you know, locally sourced fertilisers or even, you know, organic fertilisers as opposed to synthetic. Root burn, we want to avoid excessive fertiliser, um, especially in concentrated localised areas. Post fertilisation care, usually irrigation is sort of included in some form or another, particularly with granules to try and uh, prevent any sort of burning. Uh, on the leaf of the plants and this also en enhances that nutrient uptake. So we also want to monitor for signs of stress so keep regularly checking because over fertilization uh, or deficiencies might appear very quickly. Keeping those records so maintaining records, documentation, fertilization types, dates, amounts used uh, and then use these records to uh, make better informed decisions for our maintenance practices for the future. So marking out and painting obviously enhances the gameplay, clearly defined lines contribute to a better game. Um, it makes the pitch safer, it keeps spectators away, uh, then officials and players know where the playing surface is. Um, they also improve the appearance of sports turf surfaces, you know, really well marked, straight lined. Uh, pitch looks a lot nicer than the squiggly line Sunday league sort of things that you tend to see online. Um, so there is recommended paints and techniques. Obviously, paint-wise, we don't want to be using anything like emulsion. We want to use genuine registered products, um, which you can find online. Um, and we want to ensure that we're using the correct paint for our environment as well, uh, ensuring that it can withstand the wear and ensuring that, you know, the amount of rainfall, the amount of grass growth we've got, it's actually something um, that's sustainable for us as purchasers. Um, so we can consider environmental friendly paints as well. You know, there's there's ones which are, are slightly better for the environment. Uh, they might be more expensive. It's something that you'd have to consider within your workplace. Uh, and, but we want to ensure that that machinery is properly calibrated and accurate as well. You know, we want to be marking the right size lines. We want to have the right amount of paint coming out. We don't want too much, too little. We want to ensure that nozzles aren't blocked or damaged so they aren't, you know, making the lines uneven uh, and, un, you know, unable to be able to see them as well. So this is where the regular inspections and touch-ups come into it. So. We can just whip round, check the markings behind ourselves, you know, address any faded or damaged areas, particularly after games. Uh, and then we can establish, obviously, routine marking uh, inspections and top chops uh, based around our management and maintenance techniques as well. So we'll mow and we can keep his eye on the sort of sports turf lines as well. We see them fading. Obviously, we'll try and mark them out as soon as possible. So the techniques we can use, the three main ones, there's the string lines, the stencils, uh, and then the spraying equipment, so such as, you know, the robotic line markers, the, the beam liners uh, that can be used with the lasers to ensure that you get a correct straight line. Uh, obviously, the main one for most sports turf surfaces is the string line. It tends to be the default, and it's always the backup. If you know that skill and you've got an issue with your mowing machine, your marking machine, sorry, your robot marking machine, uh, you can always go back to that line marker. Uh, and use that with the string. Uh, field layout and considerations, obviously we want to ensure that we're marking out the correct markings for each particular sport. So this any sort of crucial points, penalty spots, goal areas, um, 
end goals, you know, for rugby or uh, NFL or anything like that, you know, the touch zones. Uh, and then weather conditions as well. Obviously, we want it to be dry for line marking. Um, if it's wet we or raining, we might not want to mark out because we're just going to lose the lines and it's going to be a bit of a waste of time. And then we also want to allow the uh, sufficient drying time uh, for the paint to dry before play is carried out on the surface to ensure that it's not spread out across the whole entire surface. Uh, we want to use high contrast colours. You know, if it's been snowing, we might have to use blue or red paints, but typically we use white on green grass. Uh, if you're marking on artificial pitches, you might have to use different colours. Or if you've got different pitches within pitches, you might have to use different colours for those to ensure that you can see the difference between each pitch. Um, as mentioned briefly, we can use the GPS technology, the robotic modes as well to help us try and mark the pitches. I tend to use these on the initial marks to sort of get the pitches in the first time because it saves a lot of time. But then after that, um, you know, you can save a bit of money by doing it with the string and the line yourself. Post-marking care, obviously we can inform the players about the field markings and the officials if there's any issues with them or, you know, if this, maybe they're still wet because we've had to mark out quite lately, uh, late during the day before a game. Um, we don't want that paint spreading across the pitch uh, if it isn't necessary. We can regularly monitor, you know, check for wear and tear during the season. We might see that the pitch has moved slightly. We might have to restring and re-GPS those uh, line markings just to ensure that they're completely accurate. Um, you know, the grass moves when it's cut, it gets tillered. Um, there might be some nap on the grass. Uh, it's no guarantee that you've marked the line in exactly the same place every time, even if it looks straight. Um, the end of the season, we might want to redo the markings completely. Most football pitches, for example, are corroded off, so they would need to because they wouldn't have any markings. But, you know, such as training grounds and schools and council facilities, you might not have that luxury. Um, but it also you don't want to be marking out during the summer months if you don't have anything on. So you might consider using things such as carrots or things buried that you can find with a metal detector uh, to locate the corners of pitches, but it might just be worth checking with a, a measuring tape to ensure that there's still the right sizes uh, and nothing's moved within the surface. Soil testing, I'm going to go briefly over this one because we've covered this quite a lot recently. Obviously, the purposes are we want to determine the conditions uh, you know, any from soil structure, pH levels, grass coverage, anything like that to ensure that um, we've got the data to, to manage the profile as well as possible, you know, sort of aid our management techniques. The frequencies of testing can depend massively. You know, we can do it as and when needed. You can do it annually, you can do it monthly, you can do it weekly. Depends on, you know, the profile of your environment uh, and also what's being required at that sports turf surface. It's really important to keep those records, you know, of each test and the corresponding actions taken afterwards so you can see or sort of go back and address any potential issues or might be able to see things that did work. And then over time, you can track those changes uh, and see what happens to the soil health or even, um, you know, just even over a couple of tests, you might see a difference, never mind over a long period of time. Aeration, there's quite a few different techniques, but the main ones, you've got coring aeration, where it's on the top right, you're removing plugs from the surface. Um, you've got spiking aeration, you've got slicing aeration, um, you've got solid tining, uh, which is basically the core aeration, but without pulling the core out of the surface. So there's the three different types, or four different types. Um, you know, even if you go in depth, though, within uh, just coring or solid tining, you know, a pro core, for example, would just go in and out of the surface, whereas a verted drain has a heave and flicks underneath the surface and goes a lot deeper and will crack and rupture some of the profile. So it depends on what you need and where you need it really more than anything. But we want to improve that air circulation and the oxygen it changed. So we want to improve the air circulation and any uh, oxygen exchange within the root zone, promoting a uh, healthier turf grass um, that promotes uh, root growth, you know, and water infiltration into the surface. So we might not have to put drainage in. Um, we might just need to work on the surface a little bit better to reduce water logging. Uh, considerations, you know, what sort of time we're we going to affect play? We're going to cause any issues on the surface trying to aerate when it's too wet. Um, the aerating depth, as I mentioned, 
depends massively on what you're trying to achieve. Do you want to make the top layer soft? Do you want to try and get underneath and fracture, um, you know, the, the layers underneath six, seven inches down? Depends on your test results. Uh, and then post aeration care, we can do such things such as irrigation, fertilizing, keeping his eye on the turf, ensuring that it's right. Also things as such as top dressing to try and get some sand into those holes that we've made in the surface. So you can see here at the bottom, We've got before aeration, we've got um, during aeration with the water and the air getting down to the surface and got after and then after a bit later where we've got a thicker sward, um, better root growth towards the, to further down, trying to find nutrients, trying to find water. We've broken up the surface, we've allowed air and oxygen water to penetrate the soil, uh, allowing it much easier growth for the root of the grass plant. Now debris removal, obviously, uh, effective debris removal is integral to maintaining safe and playable sports turf surfaces. The removal of debris such as leaves, twigs and other organic matter helps prevent issues like compaction and development of diseases. So some of the common things, leaves, twigs, branches, litter, rubbish, um, obviously the frequency of removal of these things uh, com completely depends on you know staffing levels uh, and what is required. Uh, high traffic areas might see more debris removal um, to, just to ensure that it's safe uh, during those periods of use. Uh, tools and equipment, we can use things such as leaf blowers, uh, rakes, any sort of debris collection machines. So um, Amazons, which would go along uh, and remove, you know, with a suction, remove those uh, things from the surface. Or we could just go out there by hand and pick them up, pick leaves up, pick twigs up, pick litter up, for example. Best practice is we try and do it when it's dry to avoid any compaction. We try and do it as regular as often to just go around and check. We want to uh, ensure that we're uh, trying to remove the debris because anything covering the surface is going to stop photosynthesis, for example. It's going to stop water penetrating the soil as well. It's also going to promote uh, thatch growth, which we do not want. We want to ensure the proper disposal of these uh, leaves, the debris as well, you know, taking it to a local waste management plant, um, composting it, you know, litters, ensuring it's going in the bin, not just being moved to another site, trying to be as sustainable as possible. Obviously, the benefits, well-maintained debris free turf um, helps improve the overall appearance of the sports turf facilities, reduce the disease risk. So any potential for disease growing in those areas that we've got leaves sitting, we've got litter uh, and optimise the playability for the playing staff and the officials. So just a few mentions on those uh, environmental impacts that I said, you know, composting uh, or, and just doing best practices really to ensure that we try and uh, make us self-sustainable as possible. Um, this one's quite a funny one, actually. You can see in the top right corner, this was uh, a council in Aberdeenshire in Scotland where they planted these trees on a kid's pitch. Um, I just thought it was quite a funny image uh, that I wanted to share. Obviously, some lack of communication has gone on there at some point. Um, post debris removal, obviously, we can do things such as just going around and checking the turf that we haven't had any disease outbreaks underneath things such as leaves, uh, do we need to aerate, do we need to top dress, blah, 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 blah. blah. Uh, follow up maintenance, can we consider any additional activities such as the aeration and seeding uh, to promote any turf recovery if required? And finally, we're on to frost or snow protection. Um, you know, frosty ice crystals on turf blades can cause damage, especially if walked on or played on, and heavy snow cover may lead to compaction, ice formation and delayed spring and delayed spring growth. Um, what we can do is we can mark out areas uh, that are prone to frost, such as bare areas, goal mouse, places which get a lot of foot traffic, try and point people towards pathways instead. Um, we can cover those areas with, uh, you know, frost sheets, or if we've got things such as under soil heating, we can use that as well. If we're doing things such as snow removal, we need to ensure that we're we're looking after the plant and the grass as well, and the ground underneath isn't frozen. We can use blowers, uh, we can use plows, we can manually clear it for smaller areas by hand, uh, or we, you know, you can apply de-icing materials to prevent the ice formation, uh, but these can be expensive and not so great for the environment. Frost delays um, can affect the play and obviously games that get put on. 
so it's important that we have clear communication uh, and plans for rescheduling in case things like this do come up. Covering the turf, we can use the frost blankets, you know, to protect against extreme cold temperatures that don't always work 100%, uh, but, you know, at least if you can get a area of sports turf surface that can be used, um, you know, the managers might be quite happy about that. If you get snow on these sheets, for example, it can be a bit of a pain. You need to clear the snow first before you can roll them back. Uh, they're extremely heavy. They're extremely difficult to work with. Uh, under soil heating is a lot easier, but obviously costs a lot of money uh, and is not very environmentally friendly. Um, we can monitor the weather conditions, though, to sort of work out, you know, if a game can be played on that day or, or can't be. If we know this whole week is going to be really cold at night, uh, we're going to have clear skies and there's a game next weekend. Uh, odds are that that game is probably not going to play just due to the ground being so cold during the week and then freezing uh, and being unplayable, for example. Um, post, you know, removal of snow or any frost protection sheets, we can then inspect the turf for any sort of damage. We don't want those sheets staying down for too long and disease farming underneath those sheets either. So we realistically, we sort of need to remove them every day and only put them down at the end of the day before we go home to to reduce the amount of time the turf is covered um, to try and prevent any sort of diseases or damage under there. And just education and training off the back of that, ensuring that everyone's aware of what's going on uh, and the importance of why we do these uh, maintenance operations, you know, with managers, with coaching staff, with the team you have around you as well.